Um, one second. I know there's a lot of like tech going on right now, so just I'm sorry for that, but okay. Thank you. Okay. I am so excited to teach this class for many reasons. One is um, that Adar is like my favorite month of the year. Um, <clears throat> A, it's my birthday. <laughs> Yesterday was my English birthday. And next, thank you. Next Sunday is my Hebrew birthday. Um, so I've always like really connected to it because it's it's the energy of the month that I was born, and also um, I love it because it's it's meant to be a time where we experience a lot of happiness, a lot of joy, and um, there's just a, there's so much here to learn that could enhance our lives and make our lives great that I'm, I'm excited to share with you what I've learned. So um, I guess I'll start with the fun stuff. So we'll start with astrology. <laughs> um, so um, I teach um, Kabbalistic astrology um, from the from the Jewish perspective, um, and what we learn in Kabbalah is that every single month of the year has its own unique energy that we're meant to um, manifest and connect to, um, and we're meant to connect to and. And um, and so the point of Rosh Chodesh is to to find out that information early on, like to be prepared so that you can make the most out of the month. Um, so um, Adar actually is um, is towards the end of the cycle. It's the last month. Right? It's the last month of the Hebrew calendar with Nisan being the first, which is next month. So we'll talk a lot about the connection between the last month, which is Adar, Pisces, and the first month, which is Pesach, Nisan. There's a, there's a, a connection with them. Just like when we learn Torah, right, there's like the, the previous week's Parsha is always connected to the next week's Parsha. There's always a link. So we'll see that there's a very strong connection between Purim and Pesach, and Nisan and Adar. Um, so... With Pisces, or Adar being the last month, it's really a collection of the entire year. It's, it's, a, it's, linked to, um, it's linked to the tribe of Joseph. Every month in the Jewish year is connected to one of the tribes. Twelve tribes equals twelve, um, 12 months. There's a, there's a link between the two. Yes? I just have a question. Isn't um, Rosh Hashanah the beginning of the year? No, there's there's a lot of uh, beginnings of the year, um, but but f technically, as far as like from the Torah, like the um, when when Hashem says in the first month of the year, Hashem is referring to Nisan. Um, I mean, that's a whole thing that we could get oh, into. Okay, I'm just confused. Okay. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, so. Um, you know what, why don't we hold questions okay, just okay. so, because it sometimes takes me a little off track, and but I'm happy to answer questions a bit later. Um, okay, so there are 12 tribes, and each tribe is connected to the month of the year. And the tribe that um, is connected to Adar is Yosef, for a lot of reasons. Um, firstly, who knows what the sign of Pisces looks like? Describe the fish. What do they look like? Are they in a circle? Like, what does the symbol actually look like? Like a crane. Like one on top of the other, three yeah. different directions? Exactly. So there, it's, if I had a board, I would demonstrate. But it's basically two fish um, going in opposite directions. And there's a lot of meaning there that we're going to explore. Um, the two fish, to start with, represent uh, several things. One, they represent the two Adars. We have Adar Aleph and a dark bet. And um, in a year when you have um, a leap year, in Hebrew it's called a Shana Meuberet. Meuberet comes from the Hebrew, of, which means um, pregnant. So it's considered a pregnant year um, because it has a double months. Secondly, um, uh, Yosef, we know that he's not considered as one tribe, that actually his sons, Menashe and Ephraim, counted as two tribes. So the, the two um, fish also represent the two tribes of Menashe and Ephraim. Um, Menashe represents um, Adar Aleph and Ephraim represents Adar Bet. Because in Adar Bet, in any leap year, when do we have Purim? Do we have Purim in Adar Aleph or in Adar Bet? Okay. 
in a dark bet. Um, also, when we celebrate Moshe's birthday, which is in the seventh of Adar, do we celebrate in Adar Aleph or in Adar Bet? Aleph. Uh, oh. Adar okay. Bet. So Adar Bet, by default, becomes the more of the celebratory month. And Ephraim, in general, like, um, we, what do we know about Ephraim? Exactly, but also Ephraim was the younger, mm -hmm. and when Yaakov went to bless the children of Yosef, he, he did like this. Instead of blessing the elder, which was Menashe first, he blessed Ephraim first. So Ephraim has this extra bracha, this extra blessing, separate from Menashe. So that's why Ephraim is associated with Bet, which is um, the second month on a leap year. So, um, and Ephraim is also another... Um, uh, uh, sign for us about what this month represents because Ephraim comes from the Hebrew word of polia. Polia means fertility and abundance. So this is considered a time of lots of blessings. This is a time when universally or cosmically there's a lot of Shefa coming down and we'll go into details like where do we learn that exactly? How do we know that this is a time for Shefa and Bracha? Um, so that's um, that's one of the first things I wanted to, to talk about, just from, from the, the Kabbalistic astrology side. So, um, in, um, in Kabbalah and astrology, one of the first uh, books that were ever written about this subject is the Sefer Yetzirah. The Sefer Yetzirah is called in English the Book of Formation, and it's attributed to Avraham Avinu, Avraham the Patriarch. Um, it's a very ancient text. Um, it's very short. But it's, um, it basically attributes to every single month of the year two Hebrew letters. And each Hebrew letter represents the planet that rules that month and the sign for that month. So that's a little out there from some people. Like people like, <laughs> might think, you know, like, where, where, is, is that weird that Avraham Avinu like, knew astrology? Or, or what do we know about him? Well, that was like normal at that time, right? So why wouldn't you know? But like we all, all of us bought shubas are like Pisces, yeah. But if you ask us like some like, obscure Mepharshim, we're like, what? You know? Well, we know Pisces, but you know what I mean? Like everybody knows. Right. So yeah. astrology was um, a wisdom that was very, very common in ancient times. It was a, it's a very ancient system. But what's unique about Jewish astrology and Kabbalistic astrology is that it attributes um, the Hebrew letters as having um, spiritual energy forces that are creative. So um, we know this, I mean, you don't even have to go far into Kabbalah, we know this straight from the Torah that when Hashem created the world, it says that Hashem spoke, spoke, and He created. That as Hashem, Hashem said, let there be light, and there was light. Everything that Hashem created was through speech. So, and the, and the language that was used was the Hebrew language. So we know that the Hebrew language is a channel for revealing um, or manifesting from spiritual into the physical. So to take that concept and link it to the months, we, we see that the way that this spiritual technology works is that every letter represents this very specific energy. And that letter, think of it almost as, as like an angel. Like a, a sort of like, okay, an angel is, is in charge of this particular month, and it rules this month, and it, and it has a special task that it's meant to uh, complete during this month. What I really love about astrology is that it allows you to approach the year in a way that's very detailed. That instead of going through your year as like one big gulp of like, you know, ups and downs and, you know, challenges and celebrations, you really um, become sensitive to how there's like an ebb and flow in the energy of, of our times, whether it's when it's the, the holidays, when it's like Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot, like, and it's a time of reflection, and then we have, um, you know, the winter where it's like dark and there isn't that much going on, and then all of a sudden we have Hanukkah and it's a time of light and miracles, so it's really the Jewish calendar is just sparkled with all of these different events that aren't you know, out of nowhere. And if you ask a Kabbalist, why do we celebrate these holidays? They won't tell you that we celebrate Passover because Hashem, you know, um, Hashem made the miracles for us during the month of Nisan, but rather that because it was Nisan, 
the miracles happen, that the unique energy of Nisan, which is the time of Passover, is a time for freedom, a time of letting go of whatever is, uh, is like shackling you down, that it, it's, it's a time to like re renew yourself, so that one is a cause and effect of another, which I think completely reframes the way that we approach the Jewish calendar as like, oh, we're celebrating things from the past, but rather see that these are spiritual sort of... Um, like uh, like a cycle that repeats itself over and over again, but it's not it's not for the sake of just celebrating an event, but rather opportunities of energies that are available to us during those particular times that we can either access and tap into and like make the most out of it and use it as tools to actualize like our greatest potential, or if we don't know about this stuff, it just passes us by and we just experience it in a more um, blinding way. I think if you think about it as like as a child, when you're a child and you're celebrating Chagim, what do you what do you know about Purim? You know that you dress up and you put on costumes and there's parties and there's Hamantashen and Mishlach Manot. Like it's all the external stuff which is important. But then as an adult you can't celebrate the holidays the same way anymore. You're an adult, so your level of consciousness and awareness and the way that you approach the holidays should be way more progressive than it was when you were like in third grade, right? So that's what we're doing here today is understanding what is the deeper meaning behind why we do what we do? Why did Hashem instill these opportunities for us? What is there for us uniquely during this month that we're supposed to connect to that we don't have any other time of the year? Are you all with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we'll go back to the letters that I was talking about. So there's, um, so like I said, the, um, uh, Adara is the last month in the zodiac, and um, oh, I just realized before we continue, I meant to do this in the beginning. Okay, so one of the things that um, I, I've taken on for this month is I'm sorry if I'm a little ADD. <laughs> it's very Pisces of me, but um, one of the things that I've decided for this month is um, every day to take on a mitzvah for somebody else. To think of one thing that I can do for another person, and well, and the reason why is because um, everything about this month is a month of joy, mm -hmm. and we know that there's many ways you can receive joy. But I believe the highest level of joy is one where you're giving to another person, and we've all had experiences where we've volunteered. And like I, I'm, I'm thinking of an experience where um, I volunteered um, at a senior center over Thanksgiving and, and had like the most amazing time dancing with, you know, these people who were like Holocaust survivors and were telling me like, it was just like, there's certain experiences in life that are just so special when you just go outside of your bubble and allow yourself to be exposed to a new experience and just give. And just that pure experience of giving just makes you feel so good. And you're like, why don't I do this more often, you know? Um, so that's one of the lessons for, for the month of, of happiness, the month of Adar, is to really try and find a way every day to do something joyful for yourself first. Um, and then for another person. And the reason why I say for yourself first is because... Um, because we all know, especially as moms, that it's very hard to give anything if you don't feel good about yourself first. You need to, I know for me that I'm the best mom when I'm, I wake up happy and I'm in a good mood and I, I feel good about, you know, the day, that's when I'm like the best mom on the planet. If I wake up and I'm like miserable, it's like, yeah, I just feel really bad. So we all know that we, we always have the, the most to give when we feel great about ourselves. Um, so that's why you have to feed your soul first, take care of yourself first, find a way to be joyful. Come join us. Find a way to be joyful, whether it's playing music or, um, what do you call it, or going to the beach or hanging out with friends, whatever it is that makes you happy, do it. And then find a way every day to engage in an activity that is for another person. And a lot of times that doesn't necessarily mean you even have to let that person know that you're doing anything for them. Like, 
what I wanted to actually do today is to dedicate this class to my sisters, which is, if they knew I was doing this, they would kill me. But <laughs> um, I want to dedicate this class to my sisters, um, Batren, Bat Jacqueline, and Inbal, Bat Jacqueline, that, um, I'm going to try not to, that in the merit of this class and the learning that we're doing together, that Hashem should bless them, that they should each find their zivuk, and get married this year, amen. amen. And and that every person who is single and wants to get married should get married very soon this year to the right person. Amen. And that um, anyone who's married and need, and wants to have children, then Hashem should bless them to have children. Amen. And anyone that needs shalom bayit, Hashem should bless them with shalom bayit. And anyone amen. who needs parnasah should receive parnasah. And anyone who amen. needs healing should receive healing and have a refuah shalema. And that Hashem amen. should protect us and the Jewish people, wherever we are, from our enemies, and should bring peace to Am Yisrael, to Eretz Yisrael, and just watch over us and bless us to live in the times of Mashiach, and that the Beit HaMikdash will be built very soon. Amen. I feel like crying. Um, amen. So, let's continue. I'm, I'm being very Pisces today, but... <laughs> what does that mean? If, but I'm being like I'm being like so raw and my emotional self because Pisces tend to be very much like you know how the uh, the sign of um, an actor is a mask. Mm -hmm. So Pisces are the actors of the zodiacs. They're like the ones that you never really know who they are. They're always hiding behind masks and they have like they're very deep very mysterious, you never know who they are, and then, but that's because they're like super sensitive and emotional and they need to protect themselves, but I've chosen to be the Pisces that is openly sensitive and openly emotional because I think that it's very um, beautiful and empowering to be your true self versus putting on a mask. So, let's continue. <laughs> Um, all right, so the letters that I wanted to talk about are um, the letters for this month. Okay, so there's we said there's two letters. So the letter Gimel is a very, very blessed letter. If you ever have a child, use the letter Gimel in their name. I, if, if I would have known this earlier, maybe I would have used it with my child, but the letter Gimel is super powerful. Letter Gimel and letter, letter Dalit. Well, da my son's name is with Dalit, so okay, so I'll take it. <laughs> but, um, okay, so the letter Gimel rules the planet that's called Tzedek in Hebrew. Tzedek, it means, what does the word Tzedek mean? Justice. Righteousness or justice, but in, um, in, uh, in English, it's translated as Jupiter. Not as exciting. But Jupiter is actually the, the planet Tzedek. So, um, this letter controls... Um, the, the controls Pisces and controls Sagittarius. So there's a link between a Pisces and a Sagittarius. People, anyone here is Sagittarius? It's the month, it's in Hebrew, it's Kashet. It's the month of, um, what is it, uh, November 20th to December 20th. Anyone in that? Okay. They are the luckiest people on the planet. It's so it's, it's, they just have, Lana, they just have like the luckiest, they just like luck everywhere. So I, I, I know this from my own experience, not only are they lucky, but they're so charismatic. They're like rock stars, right? There's, the, there's something very charming about their personality that they just like, they're very popular and adventurous and they're also, they can be really spiritual. They're also considered the teachers of the Zodiac. Um, they, they, they're very fun and creative, but they also have a very deep soulful mm -hmm. side. But that's not, that's, that's um, Sagittarius. But Pisces are also similar, but not as out, out there as Sagittarians are. Anyway, what links them is this planet, Jupiter, is a super lucky planet. And it's ruled by Gimel. And Gimel is, um, is connected to Bracha, blessing. It's connected to Shefa, which is abundance. And it's connected to Mazal, which is luck. So it's really like you hit the jackpot if you've got like this planet ruling your... The truth is that 
You don't need to be a Pisces or a Sagittarius to feel the influence of this particular energy. When we're in the month of Pisces, everyone's feeling it. Meaning like for every sign, whatever, whatever month we're in, we're feeling that energy now. So this is a, a great time of blessing for all of us, not just for people who are born Pisces. That's, that's why we're here. It doesn't work like that. I'm sorry, would you mind repeating really quickly what it's connected to? You said Shefa. Shefa, which is abundance. Mm -hmm. Bracha, which is blessing. And Mazal, which is luck. Okay. You're welcome. That's yes. the letter you know. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What? Like a Pisces in the month of Pisces get double. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Pisces is for what day to what day? Okay. So it depends according to the Hebrew or the English. So I'll give you my example, which is, yeah. Because in the English, it's February 19th to, to March 19th, right? Um, so we're in it now. It just started on Friday. So that's the, that, that's the English, uh, the solar um, calendar. It, that's the dates. But the Hebrew calendar, we started... Um, we started Pisces and Rosh Chodesh Adar, but this year we have two Pisces, we have two Adars, so it starts early. So for me, for example, I was born on, in Adar Aleph, so this I'm, an, I'm a leap year baby. But my English birthday is February 20th. But there are people who are born in Adar Aleph and they don't fall into that um, range of the Februarys, they might be born earlier on, so it could be that in the English they're Aquarius and in the Hebrew they're Pisces, so that happens where people have two separate types of signs and then that gets tricky because it's like which do you go by? So what I learned from one of my teachers is they say that your English birthday represents your mask in the world. It's like your external persona of how you present yourself in the world and that your Hebrew birthday represents your neshama. It's like the inner core of who you are. It's like a physical and, and spiritual thing. Exactly. And that you're supposed to really learn about both but that in essence your Hebrew birthday is really your essence and that's why they say your Hebrew birthday is the time to give brachot and you know, you have a special koach during that time um, than other times. But I think it's important to learn about all of it and then just take whatever resonates for you. Um, okay, so, so that's what we know so far about the letter Gimel. So that's why, what do we know happened in the month of Kislev? Hanukkah, right? So there we see miracles happening both sides. It was a time of miracles. Um, okay. So that means if you have Gimel in your name, then you're more prone to Shefa, Bracha, and Mazal? Yes, Gali. Amen. But you have to be connected to the tools to bring it down? She's like, just like You know, there's a really... There's a really amazing rabbi from Israel. His name is Rabbi Samir Cohen. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. He, he has, I wish he would translate more of his books yes, into English. Yes. Well, now the Hida Brut is, is coming to America. They're doing an American um, channel. So he did a whole series just on Hebrew letters. Oh, wow. okay. Every letter is like an hour. What's get it in English? Zamir Cohen. They have subtitles. If you go on YouTube, you can find them. Yeah. Does this work for last names at all? Yes. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> <laughs> there's six of us. No. <laughs> Listen, but there's 22 letters. Every letter. I mean, oh, we no, could. Do, you know what? Maybe we could do a class on the Hebrew letters. That could be Ooh, fun. No. Yeah. That could be fun, right? Do you take your classes for those of us who don't live here. Yeah, that's why I'm recording. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a bunch of classes online already that you could oh, see. Great. Yeah. So, um, what did I? Oh, where was I? Okay, so. I hope you don't mind that I'm like jumping around because I know I know some people like to learn very linearly linearly and I'm just like oh I'm I just go with like what okay good um, okay so another thing that we know about um, about Gimel is that it's connected to um, it's connected to protection from evil eye. 
How do we know? Because um, the Pis what do we know about Pisces? Do you ever go into Moroccan homes? Is anyone here like expo? No. Okay, so I'm Moroccan on both sides. You are. So Moroccans are obsessed with evil eye and protection from evil eyes. So you'll see like the chamsas everywhere, and then in the hand of the chamsa you see a picture of a fish, and then there's fish on the bracelets and fish on the necklaces and fish on the baby's crib. Like there's fish everywhere. So fish in in that culture is very ancient. Fish represents protection from evil eye. Does anyone know why? Because it goes under the surface of the water. Mm. Exactly. So it's not seen. So yeah. fish represents blessing that um, blessing that isn't seen. Beautiful. That whenever mm. something, you don't perceive it, you don't see it, it's protected from people's eye on it. Mm. Right? Another link to Yosef. Yeah. Right? Because um, what do we say, Moroccans? We say, Ben Poat Yosef, Ben Poat Al which is the blessing that Yosef got from his father uh, was that um, Yosef was so beautiful, but he still had this, um, this blessing, which is a blessing for protection from evil eye. How did Yosef get this blessing? What was, what, what was, how did Yosef achieve the merit of protection from evil eye? Does anyone know that? It's in Rashi. He didn't really get it though. Yeah. Uh, isn't it because he was able to stand the test? No, it was it had nothing to do with. It has to do with his mother, Rachel. It's something he did for he he did for his mother, and in the in merit of that, he received protection from evil eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, he stands oh, he in front of her. Yes. What? What is yes. Oh, Both of you tag team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, he when when Aesop is there, he stands in front of his mother, even though he's like littler than her. Presumably, he still stands in front of her, so she won't be seen by him, and her great beauty won't be admired. Exactly. So, when, uh, so, so Rashi when, when says. They bump into Aesop when they go meet Aesop at her I think it's Parshat Vayetze. Um, but if you look at the Rashi there, it says that because Yosef did that, um, because he protected his mom, he received protection from evil eye. So. Yeah. So, right? <laughs> so, so we know that Pisces in general also have that protection. Um, Pisces represents protection from evil eye. Um, okay. So now that's all the good stuff. Let's talk about the not so great stuff about people who are Pisces. People who are Pisces are water signs. The the zodiac is split up into four groups, the four different elements, which are air, water, air. Fire, 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 and earth. earth. Exactly. So air goes with fire and water goes with earth if you ever want to know about compatibility. So as far as Pisces, Pisces is part of the water group. And all the water signs, the others being Scorpio and Cancers, all the water signs, water connects is connected to emotions and being very sensitive. Um, so, so water signs tend to be like the best friends you could ever have. Mm -hmm. If you think about people who in your life they, uh, that are, um, I mean, I, I, then maybe next time what I'll do is I'll bring a chart with every, with the different dates for each sign, so that way you'll be able to understand who's who because it's kind of hard. What I normally tend to do in my other classes is I, I say, think of three of the people in your life that you're closest to, and then write down their signs because it gives you more of like a frame of reference to know. But if you've ever met a Pisces, Pisces are people that are super empathetic. Like they just totally, mm -hmm. totally understand other people's feelings and to the, to the point where it's too much. Like they would make the worst therapists mm -hmm. because they would just take on other people's feelings, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, on the one end, they could be great, but the, it's a very risky thing for a Pisces to get into because they over-identify emotionally with people um, to their detriment. And they're also like people pleasers. So they have, their nature is to be very giving. You know, some people's work in this life is to transform themselves from takers to givers. Pisces doesn't have that job. Pisces are already naturally very, very giving people that... They love to help other people, and their tikkun, and tikkun means their personal, 
point of transformation or work that they have to do is to create boundaries for themselves and to say no and to say, you know what, I need to take care of myself in this situation. There's only so much that I can give to this person. Now I need to protect myself. Um, so that's a very, very uh, big tough key, a big um, task for for Pisces because they they'll like let's say you ask a Pisces for a pen like you're at a class they'll give you their pen and that they just won't have them they're like oh it's okay I'll just like remember the notes <laughs> like they're, they're not is that for all the water sign or just Pisces Pisces <coughs> Pisces is the most generous the other one Scorpios would never do that <laughs> like mm -hmm. if anyone I don't know if any of you guys are Scorpios they're like the worst. <laughs> so they never have a pen, Wait, what right? No. <laughs> so you said that what month is No, no, no. Water is connected to Earth. Would be compatible with Earth. Earth is selfish. Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Not you. Not you. Not you. Okay. Like I said. What if you need someone? Like I don't know. Like you said. What? With air. Well, yeah. What are you saying? What if somebody calls their they're not like that at all? Exactly. And you know them well. Exactly. Yes. Well, let's hope that they're not like that in a positive way, meaning that they've done enough work on themselves that they're... No, like they're not giving, let's say. They're just not giving at all. Well, okay, so then this is... If that's I feel like be, before I start this series of every month, I should yeah. first do my intro to astrology class because you're asking a lot of the questions that is covered in that class because it's an intro that covers all this foundational sure. sort of things, right? Okay. Yeah. So maybe if we give that class on the second for like Rosh Chodesh Adar Shemini, okay. and then it can go right mm -hmm. into what we get with the new Nisa. year. Yes. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> no, because that because Gali just asked me also about compatibility, which sign goes with. Which and how do you know and and all that stuff and and so like what you're asking okay let's say someone doesn't fall into this box of Pisces of course because you know I don't want to get too in technical into astrology because I want to focus on the bigger picture of this this um, class but when a person um, wants to learn more about their astrological profile right then they need to know the date the time and the location of their birth in order to map what their astrological profile looks like so so when a person says they're a pisces all they're really saying is what their sun sign is but then there's other planets rising there's the moon sign. right there's the rising sign there's the moon there's the you know the the Mercury and each and, and seven other planets and each planet has its own influence and its own purpose. So like the sun, because it's the strongest influence, is the one that's the most dominant, is the one that people most identify with. But don't forget that this is just one sliver of personality that we also get impacted by you know, our parents, like I know, for example, my sisters are also water signs, they're cancers, but everyone else in the family is earth. So my family is all earth and water. And the, and the waters tend to be like very like creative, emotional, like, you know, very dramatic. And the earth signs are very hardworking, very practical, very like, let's get to the point, like bottom line. And you bet that that's what we're like too. You know, like, we definitely are like that. All three of us girls are like that. So, um, your parents have a very strong influence on your personality and how you turn out, you know? And vice versa. I mean, it, it goes... It, it's, it's nature and nurture. Exactly. And my favorite thing is to see people that are not their sign. Because mm -hmm. the whole point of learning about yourself is to figure out what are the things that are good and what are the things that you need to fix. Versus just saying, oh, this is who I am. I can't, I can't do it, and this is who I am. Okay, for example, like Pisces, um, I'll, I'll get into some of the flaws of the Pisces and the Tikkun of the Pisces, is that they are very complacent, very passive about life, and it comes from a deep sense of knowing that everything's going to be all right. You know, and that's a beautiful thing. They're very peaceful in general. Um, but that they also are the types of people that don't necessarily know how to deal with life head on. A lot of them tend to be like artist types, mm 
that go into like their illusionary world like um, writers or filmmakers or musicians they, they escape to the arts as a way of dealing with reality so which is good we need artists in the world but they, they're not really like let's break it down make it work it's more like oh la, 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 let's go into like a different reality and like you know escape from things um, and they also tend to be very much like oh poor me like very much like victims you know like always complaining <laughs> about, not me of course but, I'm just <laughs> but they tend to have that sort of like passive that sort of passive thing um, and then the, the 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 spiritual types are people who the reason why they don't do anything is because they know that everything happens for a reason and that things have a way of working themselves out eventually. So for some of us who believe in reincarnation, you know, some people will be like, oh, maybe if not in this lifetime, maybe next lifetime I'll get it right. You know, like, they have like a very like relaxed approach about life. So that's their tikkun. Their tikkun is to break out of that. They, they need to be more ambitious. They need to go for things. So if you're a mom of a Pisces, your goal is to help them be motivated and to set clear goals for themselves in their lives and to really help them like get practical because they're not good with money and they're not good with like business and they're not good, you know, they're just not very practical. They need guidance from that kind of, it's not something that comes natural for them. Um, so that's... Another thing. Sorry. This is the English interpretation of this, or this is the Hebrew? This is Pisces and all universal okay. understandings of Pisces. So one of the thing, one of the ways to um, to fix this problem that uh, the tikkun of the Pisces is for them to chase leadership opportunities. Pisces actually make the best leaders because what's the flaw that most leaders have? Ego. Yes. Pisces tend to not be like egotistical people. They tend to be people that are more um, focused on helping others. They love to help other people. So if you direct that energy in a position of power, then they're representing their people and they're in that position to help their people, not because they want to be you know, powerful or they want the, the title or the money they're doing because they really believe that they have the ability to take care of other people. Like Moshe. Like Moshe, mm -hmm. exactly. Moshe did not want to be a leader. He was very happy being in the desert, right? <laughs> Until he was like 80-something. Hashem had to like coax him into like doing what he was meant to do. Um, but he was the best because he was so humble and he was very, very connected to the people. Like he took them on as his flock, you know? So he's the most, he's obviously the iconic Pisces. He's like the one that we should all aim to be like. Um, and also as far as spiritually speaking, Pisces are meant to be the most spiritual because they represent the end of that cycle, the astrological cycle. So meaning they've been through all the different signs and now they're at the end of it. So they should be like, have refined their personality the most. So you'll tend to see a lot of Pisces that are very spiritual. Okay. Um, let's see. So just a little bit more about their personality and then we'll move on. So as far as, um, you know, let's, let, we'll, we'll go back to personality later. I want to continue with the letters because there's a lot more that we want to cover. Wow, it's already, how much longer, just so I can plan out the class, how much longer, because I know we said we would start at 11, how much longer do I have? You're okay. I mean, I don't think there's anything else in this room. Okay. Okay, so th so we just finished the letter Gimel. That's a really fun letter. Let's do the letter Kuf, which is... Um, does everyone know what the letter Kuf looks like? Like with the line, it's like a resh with a vav going down. Now, what's unique about this letter from all other letters in the Hebrew alphabet? Goes down all the way. Right. Is there any other letter that does that? The end letters, but the actual, like, regular, that's the only letter that goes down. So that's not such a great thing. The, the fact that the letter goes all the way down, as you can imagine, Kabbalists read a lot into that. <laughs> so the, the, the fact that that line goes all the way down, it's connected to the negative side of reality. 
So Kuf um, is connected to Klipa. Klipa. Oh, Does anyone yeah. know what Klipa means? Yeah. yeah. So Klipa represents um, spiritual impurities that exist in the world. And if you learn Kabbalah, they talk about that a lot. And basically the, the, the task of, a, of, of our work spiritually is to, to break through the klipa, to break through the um, spiritual impurities of the world and get to the essence of something. So it's almost like um, when you eat a fruit, and it has its, its um, kli, in Hebrew you would say klipa, just like a fruit that has its outer layer. You need to get to the core to actually get to the, what you really want. It's the same thing. So um, the kuf, the letter going down, represents the descent into the world of darkness. So what that means is that, um, and this letter kuf is in charge of the actual sign of Pisces. This is not the planet. The planet Jupiter was Gimel, which is the happy planet. Kuf represents a, a letter that um, controls negative energies. So what that means is, like everything, there's always the light side and the shadow side. The light side is that in the Pisces sign, they have the ability to go into darkness and pull it out and, and, and transform it into the light, right? That's, that's the highest level. If some, They actually, um, in Hasidut and Kabbalah, they talk about it as the Yerida, the falling for the sake of an Aliyah. It's a big concept in Kabbalah that, it's, it, especially as it relates to Tshuva, it's a way to reframe Tshuva that when you, when you sin or when you do bad actions, that those bad actions in and of themselves are not bad if you transform them. If you take those bad, bad actions and you learn a lesson from them or you fix that, that mistake, you transform that into something good, it's actually, you, you actually created something higher in the world than what it originally existed as. So it's called a Yerida, which is a descent for the sake of an Aliyah, for the sake of an ascent. <clears throat> so that is the potential of the Kuf that it has. But not everyone is, is so strong spiritually to be able to achieve that. So what that means is that the Kuf has the ability to control the negative powers, but if someone doesn't have, let's say a Pisces who's not spiritual, a Pisces who didn't grow up with Torah or a spiritual system or parents that have good values, just a, whatever, a regular person who somehow in their world environment just got caught up, Pisces ha are very vulnerable to negative energy. Like we said before, they're sensitive, so if they're around the wrong crowd, or they grew up with the wrong types of friends, or the, the wrong types of parties, whatever, they're the types with addictions that they could like very quickly get into drugs or alcohol or that kind of thing. They're known for that. So that's why they have to be extra careful. Okay. So, to continue with the work of the Pisces, their thing is to, is to transform themselves from being passive and allowing things to happen to them, to act, to be assertive and to, and to go for things in their life and to make things happen. Okay, so we did this. Okay, so one more thing um, that I wanted to just connect. You know how every Shabbos we bless our children? So what do we say? Um, what do we say for the boys? Oh. Right. So there's actually I, I I I never heard this before in anybody else's house, but supposedly there's a, another line you're supposed to say. So a lot of just for the boys. Yes, which is so unusual because um, in the actual Torah text, when um, Yaakov blesses the boys. It's from Hamalach HaGowel. Yes. And there's a whole thing about fish in Hamalach yes. HaGowel. Exactly. So, oh. so th this is actually, I wanted to share this because I think it's important, if, especially if you have boys, that you shouldn't skip out on that blessing. That's a really good one. <laughs> um, I could send you, but it's basically in that Parsha when Yaakov is blessing, it's the end of Bereshit. Um, when Yaakov is blessing his, um, Ephraim and Menashe, he says, Ve'idogu la'rov be'kelevaretz, and they should be, they grow into a multitude. Ve'idogu comes from the root word of dag, which is fish, that they should become abundant like, like fish, um, and they should prosper like fish. So, um, I think that that's a, that's a very special bracha to share with your, with your children, and don't miss out on it um, if, if you have the opportunity to share that. If you haven't, if you have a son and you haven't been doing it all, no, I, I like I said, I just, 
I just, I, I've actually looked it up in the sitter. It doesn't have it in the sitter. But it, in the actual Parsha, when Yaakov is blessing them, it says that. Um, so it's worth connecting and just add a few more lines and you, you get the extra bracha. Okay. Um, so one more thing we want to, we want to, okay, so if you ever meet a Pisces and they're like someone in your family or friends that you're really good with and you, and you tell them I went to a Pisces class, mm -hmm. this is what you should tell them. They need to learn how to say no. That they can't be the yes man for everything. They need to learn how to say no and it's okay to say no. People will still love them. It's okay. They're not going to be the bad guys. Because the, the worst thing for Pisces is to feel like people don't like them. They're just naturally like very nice people. But for them it's okay to say no. Also, they're like the best people to go to. If let's say you're, like, you're working on yourself and you want to hear the truth from somebody. Like, you know, like the harsh truth, like, you know, like, like you want to change yourself. You're like, give it to me. Like they're, they're going to, they're going to tell it to you like the nicest way possible. Like they're the sweetest people. So you want to go to Pisces whenever you want the real truth and, and for it to come across in a sweet way. Um, and also they're just known to be Bali Chesed. So let's say if you know that there's a Pisces in the community and you have a project that you need help with, go to them. They'll either volunteer, or they'll give you money, or they'll connect you with someone. Pisces tend to be people that love to do chesed. That's like their thing, is to do chesed. So try to find the Pisces in your community. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we'll get to the fun stuff. Yep. Do you have to okay. Fun. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, so what is the, the, I wish I had a board. We need to get a board for this class. I just don't have a marker. Oh, you should tell, next time I'll bring a marker, because it's yeah. so much more fun when you can, like, write on the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um. We'll be able to place it on the wall, so we'll be permanent. Oh, that's exciting. Um, okay, so what is the tagline for this month? What is the thing that we keep saying over and over again about the month of Adar? Increase in Right. What's the actual line? What do we say? Yeah. Right. And normally we sing it, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to sing it? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> Not really. Um, okay. So what does that mean? Like, how do how does how does one increase? Like, why would the, the why would it say in the Talmud that when a dar comes, we should increase in joy? Like, where is that coming from? Anybody? No? Well, <clears throat> it's connected to like what I said before where there's a special energy that's available during this month that is not available any other time. And we saw that manifest during um, Purim. Now, what are the actual mitzvahs that we do during Purim? Right. Right. So are these like very spiritual things to do or are they like super physical? Super physical. Super physical. We give um, food to each other, gifts of food. We give money. We drink a lot. We party. Mm -hmm. We dress up in mass. It's a lot of physical actions for a spiritual time, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually the point. Um, of this hug is that Dafka in the physicality we're supposed to infuse the spirituality that um, what we learn from Purim is that Hashem exists in the in this world in the most hidden way but it, it's in the physical in the day-to-day -day normal goings-ons of life that's where Hashem is that like we said before where we were like saying there was a connection between Purim and Pesach. Wouldn't you think that Pesach should be a time that we should increase in joy? Pesach was when we had all the big miracles and the splitting of the Red Sea. There was like so much drama. Like it was such a big, you know, experience. Why aren't we told to, to be in the Simcha and Pesach? Why in Pesach and, and why in Adar and Purim versus Pesach? We don't even see Hashem's name in the Megillah. We don't even hear Hashem's word in the Megillah. There's, there's, Hashem is completely behind, you know, behind the curtains during this story. So wouldn't we feel more joyful by celebrating a holiday where Hashem revealed himself and did miracles for us? Like why, 
Why Purim and not Pesach? Maybe because it's a greater joy to see Hashem in what is not an open miracle, but to see Him everywhere in the smaller things. Exactly. That's what the rabbis wanted us to take away from from it. That's that's why it says that we should be in joy now. Because if if we waited for miracles to happen, like on the scale of what happened in Egypt, then we would not be happy. It would take a lot. Hashem would have to... A nest comes from um, the word in Hebrew that is called... Um, what's the... Not Nisiyon, it comes from Ones, Ones, which means force, mm. that Hashem had to, to coerce nature, Hashem had to go against nature in order to show us His love and to redeem us and to break us out of Egypt. He had to work hard to get that, you know, to get us out of there. He had to like, you know, have all the waters in the world suspended. There was a lot of effort done for that. Versus Purim, like... Where is Hashem? Like, you don't, he, you see things happening, but is it Hashem? Was it us? Like, how do we know that it's Hashem? So, th that is actually like a huge theme of this Chag, is that Hashem wants us to experience Him behind the curtains. Hashem wants us to look for Him in our day to day. You know, one of the things that came up in, um, one of the things that came up in the Megillah is like a, one of the turning points in the story is that when Esther is finally queen and it's at the turning point where the Jews are about to be killed everywhere, um, Mordechai tells her, you know, if you don't save us, then somebody else is going to do it. And he says, you know, you don't know if you were brought to this position right now, Davka, to save the Jews. Maybe this, this whole thing happened just for this purpose. And what was her response? Her response was like, I'm scared. It's the king. He doesn't, I can't just show up. She was nervous. And then he said to her, instead of saying to her, no, you have to do this. Or, you know, like, he didn't give her a guilt trip. Rather, he said, okay, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it. Is that like a normal response? <laughs> He understood that there was a plan happening. He understood that there was something in place that was happening. And it was up to her to decide what would her role be. Would she just be the extra, like the background actress? Or was she going to be the lead role, Queen Esther, in, in the film of the story of, of what was happening where she was going to be active and make things happen? Because the plan was happening. Was she a Pisces that maybe had to overcome? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. Couldn't you say that, that that sort of thing happens with everything that happened to us in Jewish history? Like with with the Jews going into Mitzrayim, Paro happened to be the one who was the bad guy, but that was somebody needed to step up to that role. Yes. So, with all, with Hitler, Yamashimo, all of them. You're totally right on because that's actually one of why do we eat hamantashen and Purim? What's the point of eating like these weird looking shapes, like sweet? Why? That's of all the things, he wore. huh? The hat, the shape of the hat that he wore. His ears. I mm -hmm. I heard it was his ears. Hamantashen is actually a pocket hat. Literally. But right. So that so I I mean I'm Israeli, so I always grew up that that was the shape of his ears. But it's possible that it was a hat. I mean, who knows? But the point is that somehow we're trying to connect sweetness to evil, right? That there's there's something sweet that came out of this evil man. So just like you were saying before. Um, about all these evil people that existed throughout history, they played their role. And that is the paradox of Purim. That is what we're connecting to, is sort of like this carrying the paradox that also the evil people in the world play their role as well in, in God's plan. And that he, what he set into place 
actually was very good because the Jews were assimilating. And by him, you know, decreeing to destroy the Jews, that forced them to, to, to you know, get back on track and to fast and to do tshuva and to pray and to give mishloch monon. Like, they had to do spiritual actions to turn the tide of faith that was going against them. But it was because he triggered that that the result was redemption miracles. So he played his role right on track. And that's why we eat the hamantash and to show that even the evil can be sweet because it's in line with like what Hashem wanted. So that's the paradox of, of life and that's the paradox of Purim that you, we could hold opposites. And again, it's like the fish, right? Going in two opposite directions. Um, but while you were on the topic of evil, <laughs> the, um, one of the things that we read right before Purim is, it's called Shabbat Zahor, and it's a time when we're commanded to remember Amalek. And we know that Haman was from the, he was from the, um, from the seed of Amalek, and that we're commanded to destroy it. So Amalek actually has the same numerical value as uncertainty. Safek. If I had a board, I would show you. I would do the gematria. So Amalek, Ayin Mem Lamed Kuf, is 200. I have it down somewhere. Give me one minute. I'll pull it up. Here. 240 has the same numerical value as Safek, which is also 240. And Safek, safek means doubt or uncertainty. So... What, what, what's the connection? What is, how do you, I mean, Kabbalists are super into gematria. Gematria is a numerological value of letters and how certain words that have the same numerical value are connected somehow. So what they're trying to say here is that when you have complete certainty in your role in the world and how you are going to contribute to God's plan, you're on track. The moment that you don't know where you stand and you don't know where you, where you, what you, um, what you represent or what you believe in or what you're connected to, that's when you're creating an opening for darkness to take over in your life. So that's something that is a big lesson for the month of Adar, is to really get clear on where do you stand in your role? Who are you and where do you stand in your role in this world? How do you do that? <laughs> um, well, the first thing is to figure out what makes you happy and then find a way to make other people happy. Meaning, I mean, this is just one answer. You could find your own answer. But I believe that Hashem wants us to experience joy and that the world was created for us to have joy. And that even though there's challenges, um, I feel like you can't really experience true joy unless there's darkness. The true joy is, is really experienced once you have challenges. If you don't have a challenge, then when you get what you want... It doesn't have the same sweetness. It doesn't have the same quality of, of happiness as when you just get it easily. And we see that all the time of like these people who receive so much abundance and goodness and so much, so many things go right in their life and they're so depressed and they're taking drugs and you're like, what's wrong with these people? They have everything. It's because it came too easily. They didn't have to work for it. They, there was no challenges. So just because there's challenges in life, that doesn't mean that our birthright isn't joy. Joy is what we're supposed to experience. Happiness is what we're supposed to experience. And that's what Hashem wants for us. When you said, um, find what makes you happy and then make other people happy, are you saying those are connected or not necessarily? In other words, with how you make yourself happy or just that you'd be full enough to give or... Well, you, like I said earlier in the class, you can't give until you're full yourself, right? But I believe the true, the ultimate joy comes when you, you're in relation to other people, you know? And you're doing things that, that doesn't mean... I personally believe that... I, I, this is a Kabbalistic answer, but basically, um, we all come from Adam, right? And, and then um, Adam was, according to Kabbalah, a spiritual energy um, force that um, had different elements, different parts, and we all come from different aspects of Adam. So some of us might come from the hands, so we're like really creative and artsy and like to do like things that are physical. Some of us might come from the belly and love to cook and you know, and th those types, and some of us might come from from the eyes and are like very visual and very into like graphic design, you know, like we all have 
different parts of where we come from and what we're supposed to contribute. So you need to figure out what your gifts are. What is unique to what you... Thanks. Okay. What is your unique gift and how can you use your gift to contribute to that whole? Because that whole needs you. If, 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 the, if each part doesn't do its part, if you don't do your part, then the other parts are suffering because it's part of the whole. We're the other, parts, the um, other parts are suffering, meaning like we're all interconnected as one. We all came from that original oneness. And we all have different elements of that oneness that we're representing. And we're all dependent on that aspect to manifest itself. So it's your responsibility to take whatever Hashem gave you that's unique to you and to put it out into the world to make the world better. I think it's that simple. And we all know what we're good at. But so when you say put it out into the world, could that just mean like if you're not out in the working world, let's say, if you're a home person, a home engineer or whatever, <laughs> to put it out into the world of your family? Yes, that... your family, your friends, your community. I'm, I'm a full-time mom. You know, like, you find ways to express okay. yourself. I mean, there's plenty of, like, mompreneurs or whatever. You know, like, there's different ways to, to figure out how to manifest it in a way that's unique to you. You Like, I don't believe that the classic sort of, like, workforce is the only way to, especially in our times, we're so lucky. There's so many, such a spectrum of, of things that we can do, especially as women. We're so lucky in that way. Okay, so let me give you some practical stuff because I know we're getting kind of late and I want to get to the core really quickly. Um, so, how to be happy. Okay, let's get to the juicy stuff. Start with, two. I'm going to give you two things. Obviously, there's a lot more here. I'm only giving you like little things that you can start with. But I want you to at least start to think because it's actually a mitzvah to figure out this month. Now we have two months. You have double the time to do this. <laughs> figure out how to be happy. And be... This month, give yourself a break from being serious. Give yourself a break from being analytical and intense and ha just like be silly, be happy, just like go, like think of yourself as like a child and just be like, you know what, this month I'm just going to be free to be happy. I'm just going to allow myself to relax and just have fun, you know? So there's two things that you can do that I recommend. The first thing is don't get out of bed until you think of one thing that you're super grateful for that day. Hmm. And think of that the whole day. The whole day be like, today I'm super grateful for my hair. <laughs> <laughs> even though I cover it. <laughs> oh, which I should say, well, let's not even go there. <laughs> or you could, or I mean, that's very superficial. But you could say, I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my family. But choose things that are um, not fleeting, like hair. Choose things, <laughs> choose things that are more permanent, you know, in your life that you can be grateful for, and you'll see, and really feel that. Like, don't just say it and be like, oh, okay, no, like really feel that gratitude and feel.